Hey everybody, uh, it's Friday again. Uh, I think I talked about this with the last video, but again, I just want to reinforce, I, I know I made a post about it on the classroom uh, stream, that these videos are not absolutely mandatory. And I know, folks, this ain't, put this in country terms, this ain't my first rodeo. As a teacher, I know by me just saying this video is not mandatory, some of you that were watching are no longer watching. Some of you aren't watching them anyway. That's why I put the lecture notes uh, posted on the classroom is so that way you have the information, especially for history of rock and roll, because we don't have textbooks. Uh, so it's very important that while not necessary, it is it is important that you watch this while we're not in school in person because I do expand. I do talk about some stuff. That being said, this video, I'm going to try to make this one uh, shorter than last time. We'll just see how it goes. Let me share my screen here and I will pull up our lecture notes. Uh, I finished last time talking about Blind Lemon Jefferson. I stopped when I got to T-Bone Walker and we'll just see what we can get covered here in the next few minutes. Like I said, I don't want to keep you all on here too long. And again, if you all have any sort of limitations with uh, internet bandwidth or you know multiple people in the household that need to be on the computer because we're doing remote learning or something like that, that's why I post these on YouTube so you can watch them whenever or not watch them. Uh, I really hope you do because, again, eventually we're going to get to a point where we have to take a test. And since you don't have a textbook, all you've got are the notes and the stuff that I talk about in class. So right now, this is me talking about it in class. Trust me, if we were here, if you all were in here in the classroom with me physically, I would be going into much more detail than I am. Uh, starting off here with T-Bone Walker. Uh, his nickname, his stage name was T-Bone Walker. You see that with a lot of blues guitarists, uh, blues musicians, is they have a stage name. They have a nickname that they go by. Now, Blind Lemon Jefferson, he was blind and his name was Lemon Jefferson. But T-Bone Walker, uh, his name was Aaron Thibodeau Walker. T-Bone developed from his mother's pet name for him when he was a small child. His middle name is Thibodeau. She called him T-Bow. Not like the football player from a few years ago that honestly wasn't a very good football player and is now a minor league baseball player, but it was based off, you know, Thibodeau is, you know, definitely shows it's from the deep south. You know, somebody in the family was from around Louisiana because Thibodeau is a French name and there is, you know, even to this day, still a large number of people of French uh, ancestry that live in Louisiana. Uh, born May 28th, 1910, died March 16th, 1975. Came from a family of musicians. Blind Lemon Jefferson was actually a family friend. I want to say maybe an uncle. Some family member uh, had a musical connection to Blind Lemon Jefferson. So when he was at, you know, when he was in town, when he was in the area, you know, he would spend time with uh, the Walker family. Uh, as a older boy, but not quite, he wasn't a musician yet, uh, or at least performing musician. Jefferson, uh, he served as Jefferson's lead boy, which being blind, you know, if you had the money to hire someone, what a lead boy was is usually a 12, 13 year old that would, you know, would just, you know, crook their arm kind of like it was a prom date or something and lead that person around by the arm as opposed to the blind person feeling around with a cane. Uh, you generally didn't do that if you didn't have the money to pay someone. Someone that had a lead boy. It, it, that generally showed that they had money because uh, they were able to hire someone to lead them around. Uh, but he did that, you know, Dallas, uh, other parts of Texas. He might travel with them a little bit, but since he was still younger, you know, he didn't uh, didn't travel too far away from home. Uh, now, by the age of 20, 
he was, you know, he had been traveling with Jefferson and he was traveling all over the country, uh, playing it as a backup musician. Sometimes he would be able to get to take the stage himself. And of course, by the time you get to 1930, Blind Lemon Jefferson passes away. So T-Bone Walker, he'd already established himself. People in the music community knew that, uh, he was a talented musician, but when Blind Lemons and Jefferson dies, Walker, 20 years old, had just kind of got his foot in the door in the music industry. You know, he he's gotta find he's gotta find his own way now. Not that he rode coattails, but you know, now the biggest you know, African American recording star in the country as of nineteen thirty wasn't around anymore. Uh, by the time you get to 1935, he's recording blue. He's the number one recording blues musician using an electrified guitar. Delta blues is still probably more widespread, but by the time you get to 1935, urban blues, electrified blues is starting to take off. <clears throat> and of those who have made the switch to electrified blues, T-Bone Walker was the biggest name. Uh, now, he starts using the name, the stage name T-Bone Walker in 1942. Uh, he's known for, you know, it, it, it's just a little more exciting, a little catchier than Aaron Walker uh, because he had a very lively show, moving around a lot, uh, played the guitar. You know, this just shows right here how some historic, you know, uh, Mount Rushmore of rock and roll sort of guitarists looked at the blues for inspiration. Uh, you know, T-Bone Walker, by the time Jimi Hendrix was a young boy learning to play the guitar, I mean, yes, his, you know, Jimi Hendrix's background was in the blues. And you can tell right here, talking about playing behind his head, playing with his teeth, Jimi Hendrix did all those things. He was mimicking T-Bone Walker. Uh, you listen to some of Jimi Hendrix's music, uh, specifically Red House, which is on the playlist. Excuse me. Uh, All Along the Watchtower isn't really a blues song, but if you listen to the Jimi Hendrix version of All Along the Watchtower as opposed to the original All Along the Watchtower by Bob Dylan, you can see, you can hear Jimi Hendrix's blues influence in his version of it. But Red House by Jimi Hendrix is just a straight up pure blues song. Uh, another thing, using drumsticks, using other musical implements to play his instrument. I mean, that's no different than say, uh, Jimmy Page from Led Zeppelin. You know, it wasn't uncommon for him to pull out his double necked guitar. And, you know, I've watched videos of him playing on stage with like a, uh, cello bow playing on the guitar you know he at that shows and and american blues had a heavy influence on the musician the british musicians of the 1950s going into the 1960s and for the longest time jimmy page was a blues guitarist toured through the 40s 50s on up into the 60s as you get into the mid to late 60s and of course by the time you get to uh, 1975, when he passed away, he he was not performing really from the late 60s until his death in 75. Uh, the song that I put on the playlist from T-Bone Walker is Call It Stormy Monday. You ought to give that a listen again, just to get a feel, even if he's not your favorite of the blues artist, you know, you ought to give him, a, a check him out, give him a listen. Muddy Waters here, uh, McKinley Morganfield, was his name. He was nicknamed Muddy by his grandmother because, according to the story, he had a uh, he had a propensity to go out. You know, after it had rained, he goes out to play, and he came back in covered from head to toe in mud. By the time he was 16, 17 years old, he was already making a name for himself, performing at local parties. Uh, you know, he was. When he made it in music, before he moved to Chicago, he was living as a sharecropper, you know, just playing music in the spare time. So he did that from 16, 17 years old up until he ends up moving to Chicago at the age of 25. First time he moves to Chicago, it really doesn't pay off. 
Uh, he has to move back to Mississippi uh, in less than a year. He, you know, like I said, his his music career didn't really take off first time, but he ends up going back to Chicago after getting tracked down by the Library of Congress. You know, he had made enough of a name for himself when he went to Chicago in 1940 that by the time he moved back to Mississippi in 41, people were still talking about him in Chicago. Members of the Library of Congress were going around recording individuals, you know, and their music to preserve the type of music they played. You know, they sent people into the Appalachian Mountains to get samples of bluegrass, into the Deep South to get samples of blues, you know, people that wouldn't typically be recording uh, or have recording contracts with record labels. But the Library of Congress ends up tracking him down in Mississippi in 1941 as they start playing that for people. Well, when he moves back to Chicago, I think he moved back in 42, it might have been 43, he finally starts getting some gigs playing in some uh, larger bars. He ends up uh, coming into contact with Leonard Chess, the owner, uh, who eventually is going to become, he was a bar owner, and he eventually ends up starting the record label Chess Records, which was the biggest blues uh and, you know, as long as Chess Records, as long as Chess was alive and Chess Records was running, Chess Records was, that was the label you tried to get signed to if you were a uh, African-American blues musician. Uh, you know, he played that urban, electrified, more upbeat, like I asked about on that last quiz. You know, he wanted his blues, as he put it, to have a little pep. And most of his songs were very lively they were not delta blues where it was down you know sullen downtrodden sort of music he won six grammys over his uh musical career which again is outstanding because due just due to inherent racism in our society at that time a chess records was still a small label b being an african-american artist male or female you know, the, the deck was just stacked against you. And for him to win six Grammys during that period in American history, you know, it, it just goes to show that how well-respected his music was, even to the point that, you know, he could overcome the inherent racism that uh, artists ended up facing at this point. 1987, uh, he ends up getting inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. This would have been the second class. Uh, the first class inducted in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame tended to be those first, that first generation of rock artists, you know, Elvis Presley, Jerry Lee Lewis, Chuck Berry, uh, Little Richard, ones like that. 1987, you start to see influences on rock and roll get inducted. And this is one of the things a lot of the artists I talk about, if they're in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, that's going to be one of the things I put in the notes. It's going to be a question you tend to see on tests and stuff. You know, what year did Muddy Waters end up getting inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame or something like that? Uh, he ended up having four songs on the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame's 500 songs that shaped rock. Uh, songs of interest. I mean, there's a lot of stuff. Muddy Waters is one of my favorite blues musicians, but Rolling Stone, that is the, where the Rolling Stones got their name from. Hoochie Coochie Man, uh, Manish Boy, got my mojo working. Uh, my personal favorite song of his is probably 40 Days and 40 Nights. Can't remember if I can't remember if I put that on the playlist or not. Uh, if I didn't, Maybe go look that one up, see what you think of that. But the uh, beat in his uh, songs, uh, Hoochie Coochie Man, Manish Boy. You know, if you listen to Manish Boy, you're going to end up recognizing it more than likely if you know Bad to the Bone by George Thurgood and the Destroyers, uh, which at one point I also put on the playlist for this chapter. Now, I'm going to make a second video, but I'm going to go ahead and stop right here because I've got something that I need to take care of real quick, and I will pick up right here and post this video immediately after we get done, and I will talk to you all in a minute.